Hey guys, my name is Chroma Key, aka Alex Furman, and I'm DJ Kelvin Wong. Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of The Journal, where we cover all kinds of different stories. Today's show is going to run a little longer than normal due to the large amount of documentaries we have. We'll have everything from homelessness to hockey. Let's get started with Stephen Fenton's piece on local hockey team. My name is Graham Maxwell. I'm currently playing on a team that's called More Than Just Richards, and I'm playing the position I've always played, uh, right side defense. I don't know, a lot of kids when they were growing up, you know, you got thrown into those sports, everybody's played their baseball, their soccer, and hockey was just the sport for me. Like, it was just something that I always liked doing. Um, I, as soon as I get on the ice, that's just how I feel. Like, I just feel great, and that's the, that's the sport that I stuck to. And um, Pretty much hockey was the most enduring sport. It kept me in the best shape, and it was the one I actually enjoyed playing. My name is Brett McChesney. I play for the uh, more than just Richards, and I'm uh, number 13. When I was a kid, I probably played for six years, six or seven years. Mostly house league, played SHA for a little while, and shattered my ankle at the AA tryouts. And then this is my second season since I've been back. Well, I wanted to continue playing hockey because it just makes, makes me feel good. Hockey to me is like, as soon as you step on the ice, it's, it's different. Like there's, there's no more care. Like it's every, everybody has their, what you'd say a vice. Like some, some people ride their bikes. Some people run, run, run on a treadmill. I go on the ice. I like hockey because it's a fun sport. I like to watch it. I like to play it. I've always liked hockey. We always watched it as kids. Older brothers watched it. Wanted to play it. Soccer sucked. Baseball wasn't that good, so I tried hockey. Loved it. Well, the Richards was started uh, from our individual team. Uh, there was a few of us, you know, the better players. Uh, and we all just wanted to get away from this individual team because, you know, you have a couple of the stragglers that sort of hold you down. So we created our own team. And uh, the Richards, uh, we've just, we graduated a division, Di didn't even know we'd be that well, and we've actually won our first game. It was an overtime nail-biter win, but uh, we looked good for a group of guys that have just started, and uh, it's looking to be a good season. Team's amazing right now. Started on a shitty team last season and picked all the good players and cut all the shit, and now we got a really good team. Going every week and seeing it, um, it's not really about the the activity. It's about the team because without without a good team, you're 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 nothing. I mean, you know, Gretzky had a team, and if if his team wasn't any good to follow with him, he wouldn't have been as good as he is. So, you pretty pretty much the whole idea about going and playing hockey is the whole team mentality and just knowing that you and him and him and him and him are going to work together to win. And that's the whole point. Hockey means to me um, fun activity, fast-paced sport. Keeps me in shape, and it's an excuse to get drunk on Sunday. I wouldn't say I love hockey. I would say I need it. It's, I mean, like, there, there's a bit of a difference between a, a want and a need. A want is something you love. A want is something you work towards. I I need hockey. It's the only sport I know. It's the only sport I fully understand, and it's the only really thing that that re re relates to me. Four, three, two. Man, that was awesome. But I don't think those hockey players are playing rough enough. Next up, we have Mark Jones's doc on the Kingston market. Roll it.
Kensington Market for me is a place where I feel like I can just be a part of and I feel like I belong. Um, it's a community with all sorts of different personalities and different people with different perspectives of life. Saturday morning, people go shopping to get fresh fish, fresh meat, fresh fruits and vegetables, and even just around, just to go for a walk, even just to kind of get the feel of a neighborhood, um, to look around at the, the graffiti murals, the colors, the vibrancy, vintage shops, natural herbs and oils. And I feel like it's a place where people can just go and really feel relaxed. Also in the market, you'll, you can find a uh, fresh fish market, which is um, unusual in a, in a city, I guess, because um, you can find your fish usually in supermarkets in the frozen food section, but if you come to Kensington, you can see the guys as like a, you know, real fisherman kind of guys, scheming the fish and bagging them and washing them. So it's a, it's a nice feel, it's a real local feel, buying your fish even. Every third Sunday of the month, Kensington Market has what's called a pedestrian Sunday, where they close off all the roads within the neighborhood, and they have local musicians, local artists, and local dancers out on the street, um, either selling their clothes, dancing, selling records. All of the artists really are there to promote themselves and for the people to enjoy really their music from you got like hip hop, you got rock, you got country, you have jazz. So it's 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 a place for everyone and there's something in Kensington Market for everybody. I think you're going to need a bigger grocery bag. But in the meantime, we are going to get a look at what it's like being no more than a few inches tall with Alice Berman's doc on pet rats and guinea pigs. See it. When people think about rats, they think disgusting. Black plague carrying, baby biting vermin with ugly tails. Well, I'm hoping this documentary will make people think a little differently. Meet my two rat roommates, Argenta and Maze. Argenta is the friendly one. She's always up for meeting new people, and she's gotten rather attached to the person she knows best. Maze is the not-so-friendly one. She's not the disease-carrying rat you find running through the sewers, but as you can see from this footage, she's a bit shy and kind of creepy looking. Rats are very curious and active. Since their small cage isn't too exciting, I let them run around my room sometimes. I've got a lot of stuff, so there's plenty of things for them to climb and explore. The only place that's off limits is my closet, because rats chew everything. Luckily, the occasional piece of shredded fabric is the only thing I have to clean up. They seem to understand my bedroom is not a bathroom. When playtime is over, they run back to their cage where a tasty treat awaits. Since rats are omnivorous, I try and give Argenta and Maze a good assortment of foods. Broccoli seems to be the one thing they never get tired of. Contrary to popular belief, rats are clean animals. Even though they do a pretty good job of bathing themselves, a bath time buddy is always helpful. Rats are crepuscular, which means they sleep on and off throughout the day. Of course, it's hard to sleep when you've got a camera following you around. 
although not everyone would agree with me. As well as being smart and playful, I think rats are pretty adorable too. But maybe this is a face that only a mother could love. Play Wookie Play. Domesticated or not, a rat is a rat, but I guess if you can't see it, the, I'm, I'm sure Kim Roberts' doc about vision will help clear every, all that up. Play it, yo. This is Vision Aids, located in downtown Toronto. This is a store that sells a wide variety of products for the visually impaired. It is sponsored by the CNIB and is run by Bob and Miriam Gindy focus is to help the blind and visually impaired to get the products to help them for daily uh, living. So we're the only store beside the CNIB. Uh, we carry products more maybe ma than the CNIB and easier for them to access here because we have everything in stock. They could come, feel it, touch it, and they buy it. When we hear about visually impaired people, usually the first thing that comes to mind are seeing guide dogs and walking sticks. However, there are several more products available to help make life a little bit easier. Some of the most common products are various everyday digital appliances, such as clocks, that are operable by voice command. Buttons can be difficult to find or press, and electronics with menus are nearly impossible for them to set. Voice-activated menus work around this. Products that work with liquid, such as ones that alert how high a mug is full of hot water, or a spike milk bag to avoid cutting open a bag of milk and injuring oneself or spilling, are also really helpful. Milk bags inside. You yeah. purse it, yeah. and you keep the milk uh, yeah, fresh inside. Blue, and when you pour it, it doesn't make blue, any uh, like you don't spill around. Uh, you could degrease it. You could change the colors, and you could take a photo and uh, pause it. For example, up there, and you pause it, and you could see it down there. You could bring it down. You could see it. And this is a very popular item. If somebody has hand problem or anything, they can't hold it, it's heavy. They give them a distant or they never use a magnifier. This is give them a distant how to use that. This is handheld. You could hold it away from the print and read while you are sitting yeah. back. Yeah. This is, you have to yeah. look in the top here to see it. Yeah, All the magnifiers, anything larger is weaker, smaller goes stronger, which is from three times up to 14. It was very small area. And anything is stronger, you have to be very close to see the print. Alarm on. Alarm off. And if you want it like music, it goes in music as well too. Or you wake up in the morning like on a music. Okay. This is bingo cards for the visually impaired. You know, when they uh, use it, like as soon as they call the number, they just uh, close it with this windows. Instead of putting ship on the over the numbers, just to close Miriam herself windows. suffers from seeing negative images and felt that she needed to help others with visual impairments. With Bob's help, they have made a positive impact on the community that increases on a daily basis. 
by offering a wide range of options to help tackle the issues of being visually impaired. I love to help visually impaired people because I'm visually impaired myself. That makes it easier for me to understand this, uh, you know, what they are going through and change their life as well too. I hope I never lose my vision. And if you have lost faith, check out Irma Duplessis doc that goes behind the scenes of United Church's Earth Day presentation. Let go! Welcome to the United Church of Canada's interactive Earth Day webcast in the season of Easter. I'm Marty Tyndall, moderator of the United Church of Canada. Um, you're on your side. side <laughs> you're on your side. <laughs> Well, at least that the moderator of the church, uh, Marty Tyndall, was uh, interested in doing a, uh, an Earth Day special, uh, a one-hour one webcast special production on Earth Day, April 22nd, 2012, and wondered whether it was possible for us to do uh, that kind of production at that level uh, uh, in, uh, in, in our television studio here at Centennial. I'm nervous about the show because this is the first time that I've ever been live. I'm not so much worried about other elements of the show, I'm worried about me screwing up or something happening. I, don't I chose Centennial because I knew Shell Reisler, but I also knew that this had a very high quality studio and excellent students, and we had a large production that we were embarking on, and I needed some really good help, so I figured this was the place to come. Uh, Earth Day is th the one day, I guess, that we dedicate to, to worshipping, in a sense, to worshipping and respecting the Earth. and. It's basically a, a day for us to realize that we only have one planet Earth. When I was in Durban, we had the expression, there is no planet B. Um, we can't mess it up. We are messing it up. And we need to take better care of, of our home. And this is the only home we have. That was a oh, I thought today's production was seamless. It was just a great team to work with. Everybody did their job beautifully. And uh, I was reassured, as was David and uh, Caitlin throughout the hour, that we were doing our job as well. So I'm delighted with the response, and I'm particularly delighted with the fact that so many hundreds were watching us. Yeah. First class, professional yeah, job from the, from, the li from the lighting and the staging oh, with yeah. Crispy and, from, uh, and, and, uh, and Andrew to the actual production under the leadership of Colin. Such a masterful, capable job, yes. smooth as silk. Uh, you know, we had several takes. Some of them <laughs> were extremely, uh, you know, nerve-wracking. And the Skypes and, all worked. And that all the Skypes worked. I was, I was, I was, was, I was about to start jumping around the control room and call on the voice of reason says, we're not finished yet. <laughs> I was ecstatic at how well the production went. It was incredibly smooth. The crew was extraordinarily professional. We had no glitches and we were all kind of crossing our fingers because we Skyped in five people and that can, that can be a big unknown. It all worked out and uh, we looked at our numbers. We had no idea what, an audience, what kind of an audience we were going to get. At any one time we probably had 400 people watching and certainly the Twitter went off the charts. It well, was like a skyrocket. Mm -hmm. The actual airing of the production worked beautifully and perfectly. Um, so uh, we had uh, a crew of about 13 or 14 or maybe more, 15 or more uh, students, uh, every single one of whom did their job just like professionals. But, uh, really, truthfully, uh, I'm just super proud of you guys. So just, uh, you're so professional wow. and well-trained and yeah. well-executed. It was a beautiful job. And not just that, just the overall attitude, just in being with folks. Yep. It, it reminds me of when I, I used to work in the Catskills as a waiter to kind of earn my way through school. And I remember I used to serve hundreds of meals, hundreds and hundreds of meals. But then I thought for every individual who comes in to eat, that's their one meal. Mm -hmm. That's their feast. And so I have to put myself into their shoes and serve them like it was as special for me as it was for them. And that's what you guys did for mm -hmm. these folks. Yep. You, so did. Really, you did. Really, really you really did. You did. Lordy, lordy, I think I'm convinced. This next dog, though, will convince you in a strange way that maybe being homeless isn't all that bad and Eric Terry's homeless guy by choice. Yeah, oh God, 
to figure it out. Find out what it's all about. And so I, I started to see what I, I would call the space between, or, 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 or the idea of nothing. And then I started thinking about what is nothing. And as soon as I, I realized that, that, uh, that s nothing is an idea. So in order to understand nothing, it has to be something. So I started looking into the space between. And I realized that that's, that's all that there really was between us was just empty space. That we're really like all so close to each other all the time. Because we all come from the same thing. But the ladder still stood straight up. You know, there's still people who stood at the top rungs and there's still people who stood on the bottom rungs. And to me, I thought the idea was to turn the ladder on its side so that we were all stood like rungs, standing straight up together. And it was just the connections between us that held us together. That we're both, we're all human beings. We all live on this, the same planet. We all live in the same park or we're all here right now. And then I found myself. There was just extremes of what people saw. Same thing in like the political realm of our society or in a lot of other things. Everybody sees it as right or left or up and down, forwards or backwards, right? But to me, it's all part of the same circle, the same sphere. And they're just the extremes of it. It's all the same thing. It's just where are we looking at it from? This is you. 
to you okay. right here. Okay. Okay. That's that point right there, me and you. Okay. And then when you you go off, you take that point there. You're still connected, right? Yeah. And you and take so let's that say point. I'm connected right now with yeah. With Aaron. And so like Aaron is this point. Okay. And I'm this point. And we're all connected. We're all connected. And that's and what then, all these other. Uh, those are all of the con connections. Like this is the spider web of our consciousness. I live on planet Earth, so as long as I'm on planet Earth, I'm at home. And I can stand anywhere and I can have nothing, and I'm, and I'm at home, and I'm happy. And now I smile. I'm still not going to sleep on the street after seeing that. Now we have a doc about the Toronto International Auto Show. Let's watch. Hello guys, Zach Merlo here from The Journal, and welcome to the 2012 Toronto Auto Show. We're here to check out all the awesome cars today, and maybe a little more. Let's go take a look around. The Toronto International Auto Show is Canada's largest auto show and most prestigious consumer event in Canada. This event has been held in Toronto, Ontario since 1974 and is located in the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. It is a major tourist attraction and is extremely popular in Ontario, bringing in an average of 300,000 visitors throughout its showing. The show takes place in February on an annual basis. In addition, it is North America's largest auto show held inside a stadium. What is different about uh, the 2012 Kia as opposed to the 2011 version? Well, actually, that's kind of the funny thing. Is there's not really actually too many differences between the 2011 and 2012. They got such great responses from the 2011. It's sort of like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right, so realistically, there are some different interior differences. The only main feature that is actually different is there comes with an option where you can actually automatically fold in your side view mirrors. Realistically, as far as option goes, that is the only difference. So this is the new Kia Rio 5-door. It is the new 2012 edition, um, and it has won the award for best new family car. It's nice and roomy, enough space for everybody, and uh, I heard it's really fuel efficient too, so it's a really nice car. I think I might trade in mine for it. So it seems to me that this year, Kia has taken away a lot of awards this year for a lot of their cars. We've got top safety pick for the Kia Soul, the Kia Forte, and the Kia Sorento, as well as the new Kia Rio 5-door winning best new small car. So it seems to me that they're winning a lot of awards this year. The Toronto International Auto Show, in partnership with Auto Trader, exhibits over 1,000 cars, trucks, and SUVs, as well as concept cars, exotics, classics, motorcycles, and alternative energy vehicles. Auto Trader is the presenting title sponsor and show program publisher of the Canadian International Auto Show. The Auto Show also rents booths to over 125 exhibitors promoting contests, products, services, and even locally owned vehicles. Okay. Oh. Oh, not again. Come on, keep going, keep going. So I'm a little disappointed. I didn't quite win Volkswagen's little driving simulator game, but at least I know I can still drive home. But uh, besi that's besides the fact. Volkswagen looks like they have a lot of new cars coming out. They've got the new Jetta, they've got the EOS, they've got the new Volkswagen uh, Beetle. They've got the GTI, they've got a lot of new cars coming out. Not so many award-winning ones, but it looks like they're getting there. They have a lot of nice new cars. Hello, Kia. The 60s called. They want their concept car back. And here we are, folks, the second part of our tour here of the auto show, the exotic exhibit, where all the fanciest, nicest cars from all over the world, including Europe, are shown here for you guys. Let's go inside and take a look.
card and save some money and maybe you can afford one of these things one day. Even all the way over here at the auto show, we can still find friends of ours from Centennial all the way at the transportation program. Making it seem like everybody can buy them even though you really can't, like yeah. you don't have the money. Well, I think they, first of all, they should let us in the damn cars if we pay 20 bucks to get into them. Let me in. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have here at the Auto Show. I'm Zach Marillo from The Journal. Back to you guys at the studio. Man, too many cars for me. Up next, we have Mark Cousy's behind-the-scenes film, Knee Deep, with starring Chris Langenzard. Chris Langensardi, I'm an aspiring actor. I took classes at uh, Humber College once a week, and uh, one like a basic 101, and then after that took scene study, and then after that I went and I started taking uh, classes at Second City. I've been acting for, I started auditioning in September of 2011, and uh, so it's been about what, nine months now? To eight, nine months, I've done probably about after today, probably about 11, 11 different projects. You want to go for a walk with me? Tell me more about your story. Family's got a sugar shack, sugar shack out by uh, behind the house. Sounds pretty exciting. When should we go? No time like the present. Oh my God, Earl, leave the poor guy alone, okay? It's already nine o'clock and it's pitch dark outside. You can show him tomorrow. What do you say, Neil? Since I started auditioning, I've been actually pretty busy. I mean, I did a TV pilot, uh, independent uh, TV pilot. It was called Fast Train. The one called Tori's Gold, I Shattered. My first paid gig was a corporate video. This uh, film, uh, Knee Deep, which we're currently uh, shooting today. And it was like, so this was something I always wanted to do. It was one of those things on a list of things I wanted to do. This was it, and I thought, now, and I was just too busy. I was just so busy, and then I thought, you know, now things sort of settled, the recession hit a bit, and I said, you know what, if I'm gonna do this, now's the time. And I'm not married, I don't have any kids, I don't have a mortgage, things to worry about, it's just me. So who I'm more responsible for me, so I said, if I'm gonna do this, now's the time. Um, I say go for it. I, if my advice to anybody would be just go for it. If there's something you really want to do, I would say take an act, go to like a college, community college, take a basic acting cl class. I think see if this is something you really want, um, and then just go for it. I think it's something. If it's something you really want to do, do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because like I'm dreaming of fame, fortune, and riches, and all this. Because the percentage of people that actually do make it. It's very small. It's very small, and uh, and in this industry, yeah, it's very tough. I've known a lot of people. I work, when working in TV, I know people that were studied acting and became reporters and hosts and stuff, and they had one hell of a time trying to make it in this industry. And um, so I'd say go for it. But I, I think yeah, you got to just come up with a game plan. When I went in this, I came up with a bit of a game plan. What I had to do, I set goals for myself where I wanted to do every little and just try to meet those goals. But no, I never really set a hard date, but I just set little mini goals for myself where I wanted to do da, 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 all along the way. Well, I'm Chris Langensardi, and I'm on the set of Knee Deep. Peace. Now that was some serious acting. Next up, we have Chris Pattison's Friday the 13th Walk. I hope you don't get too scared. Friday the 13th Walk is, is kind of like the idea of zombie walk where, like for zombie walk for example, it's just a once a year we get to dress up in whatever costume, slutty, non-slutty and whatever, and then just have blood on you. How I started it was I'm like, yo Gabby, and she's like, yo, and I'm like, we haven't met, we haven't chilled for such a long time. She's like, yeah, I know, I'm like, I'm going to I'm gonna make the time, Adam, uh, I'm, and on Friday the 13th, 
of last year, I'm like, yo, I'm just gonna, after school, I'm gonna come down, we're gonna get face painted up. Some of the impressions we got are, some people looked at us, smiled at us, and said, oh yeah, next time we'll join you, and something like that. Um, some people didn't really know what was going on. Some people said, awesome face paint, awesome makeup, good job. And uh, I always try to introduce or credit Gabby in it because I'm like, my sister did this. She's the genius behind the paint. They could be smiling too as they're saying this or they could say, that looks awesome. And they just walk by or whatever. Or they're just like wave from across the street as they see us. And uh, the neutral responses are mostly um, just them walking past us. They, they, would, they would see us. They would see us passing by them. They would see us like all bloody or whatever with a mask and whatnot. Okay, guys, this is going to be the last time you see me actually looking normal. So, <laughs> wish me luck and see you guys at the Friday the 13th walk. <laughs> Before and after, Sean. Let's do this. Perfect. I will go around, I will lead the group, and we will together march. And I will approach random people and I will say, Happy Friday the 13th. I will sneak up on some people and go, Boo, ha, or rah, or something like that. And, and again, wish them Happy Friday the 13th. It's just me and Gabby are the originators of the Friday the 13th walk. Uh, at least here in Canada, that I can really think of, because I, I, I didn't see it anywhere else. So, really, she's the makeup artist. She's the one that makes it look good, you know? And then, and then we, ha we share such a great chemistry. At the moment, I'm kind of like the head person who does a face painting. Though there are, like, say, for example, um, the people who come in for the walks, it's mostly our friends. So then with them, whenever I have my paints all set up and whatnot, they would come in as well and say, okay, I want to do this, and they can do it to themselves as well. I don't necessarily have to be the one painting them, but it's mostly where I'm kind of the one doing it mostly. We use the social media, so like Facebook, um, I believe Twitter he has, and then through our friends, we either text them or call them up and say, hey, do you want to come with us to do this? You can get face painted, stuff like that, kind of like to bribe them to come with us. Unfortunately, that's all the documentaries we have to show. And this season has come to an end. We have had some tears, some laughs, and probably a little blood here and there. But we stay strong and keep pushing on. And so should you. I'm Alex, I'm Chroma Key, a.k.a. Alex Furman. And I'm DJ Kelvin Wong. And have a nice apocalypse. And we'll see you on the flip side. Hey, <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. I got it. Uh, <laughs> <hold it back. laughs> I don't know. What are you doing over there? Going with keys. I can't. We're <laughs> still alive. That's why you did it. <laughs> So, so, uh, so, everyone. Uh, 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 everyone.